Put your hands together for Mr. Marky Ramon. Uh, you came in in 1978? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first song I recorded with them was uh, I Want to Be Sedated. Everybody knows that one. I wanted to monitor that yesterday, <laughs> last night, but I don't, I don't drink, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, sober for how long now? Uh, let's see. Too, too long to remember, so that's good. 30, 37 years. Wow. Yeah. Like hey. yeah. Now they got these fake beers, <laughs> and you try one, and I say to myself, something's missing. <laughs> it's the alcohol. <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, I've, I heard you mentioned uh, you, you had a trial with the New York Dolls before you. Oh, yeah, we were friends. Yeah. Me, David, and Johnny Thunders and Jerry. We all hung out at the same places. Their first drummer, Billy, died in London in, in a bathtub. And uh, they needed a drummer when they got back. So they knew Jerry for a while. And I just got off a heavy metal band called Dust. And I was trying to impress them with all my 5-4 uh, time changes, 6-4 time changes, triplets, quadruples. And Jerry just kept the beat. That's all they needed. Yeah. So they, they chose him, which in the end worked out fine. Yeah, that definitely you know. worked out for everybody, for but sure. But they, they were good guys. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about the, 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 your, uh, the way you came at that audition. Uh, you're a big blues fan. Oh, yeah. Well, what, what, what did you grow up on? Uh, I liked uh, Phil Spector stuff when I was a little boy. I loved the Beatles as a little boy. I still do. Um, British Invasion. I liked the one hit one. Is the first record I bought was Purple People Eater. You know, by a Sheb Willie. Well, actually, my parents got it for me. I was too little to save any money. And then I bought the Monster Mash by Bobby Boris Pickett. Because he sounded like uh, Boris Karloff, and I and I thought that was him, but it wasn't. But it, it was great. And then uh, as I moved on, I started listening to the Who, you know, the usual stuff. Yeah. You know. how, how early did you find the drums? Grow, growing up in Brooklyn in the '60s, '70s, '70s, yeah. 70s, yeah. Wait, wait, how, how was that? Rough. Yeah, no doubt. That was that was pretty rough. Yeah. Brooklyn's a very tough neighborhood, you know. Yeah, I, I've been to New York a, a handful of times. I, I love the city. I, I've been been through most of the. It's problems. a little different now. It, it is a, li a little different now. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> a lot less seedier than it was uh, my first visit. Yeah, but I like that. <laughs> it, it had, you know, it's and and like as someone for me who grew up watching those, you know, New York is one of the most filmed cities in in all of cinema, and you 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 see how you that, see it. In the you, movies. You do. You really see it. And then you get there and you have this expectation. And like I said, I remember my first visit to New York, it had that feel. You feel it. You see it in the movies. Uh, French Connection, The Seven Ups, uh, which uh, was a car chase movie. You know, bad guy, good guy. Dog uh, Day Afternoon. Was that New York? Dog Day Afternoon was, uh, was Brooklyn. And uh, you see it, which, which is great. You know, they're all time capsules. You know? Yeah, for sure. So... Uh, one of my big, big, uh, early influences, and I still love the man today. I wish I would give my left arm to have been alive to, to have seen him alive, but, uh, you had a run in with Jimi Hendrix. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? It's a very young kid and uh, I was with somebody all of them, maybe went to a club. Uh, I had to go to school the next morning. Uh, but I went, uh, cause one of the guys that I knew knew him. So he took me there, and uh, it was he, he was sitting at a round table with Jim Morrison and then drummer Buddy Miles. Mitch, Mitch, Mitch Mitchell wasn't in the band anymore. So they were rehearsing in New York City for their live shows at the Fillmore East. They did two shows, two nights. And that was it. You know, I mean, what, what can you say? I was yeah. 16 or 17. And... Um, there he was. Yeah. And, uh, two two years later, he he passed away. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah. 
Uh, and uh, you see a lot of these uh, experiences, like the Jimi Hendrix experience yeah. touring. Uh, you got the hologram and, uh, you know, the, the great lineup of mu- musicians. And, Mitch Mitchell was great. The drama was great. Fantastic. Well, one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, me too. Sure. Me too. Yeah. Jazz drama. Yeah. Jazz drama turned rock. Yeah, for sure. Uh, 1,700 shows, 15 years, and... Uh, then you find yourself on stage accepting Rock and Roll Hall of Fame awards and Lifetime Achievement awards, Grammys, and all that stuff. They they they, uh, they make good bookends. <laughs> they, they definitely would make. Good, good <laughs> I, you know, you look at them, you go, ah, "That's nice," you know. Yeah, and, and obviously bittersweet uh, not having the the boys there with you. Well, up on stage. Uh, Joey wasn't there. He passed away before we got all that. Unfortunately, he would have loved it. You know. Yeah. Uh, but, but after a while, you know, it, it's nice to be, uh, liked, but they are, you know, it's stat the statues, you know, it's not, you know what I mean? It's yeah. all. Um, I play the drums too, and I'm just wondering, uh, who are some of your biggest influences? Oh. Yeah, okay. Hal Blaine, Phil Spector's drum, uh, Wrecking Crew, uh, Ringo for sure. He, uh, he, to me, as a little boy, he was very animated, like a cartoon. That's why I liked. I took, I threw, well, I didn't throw them. I put away all my tanks, helicopters, and soldiers, and I started listening to the Beatles. And um, in a way, I mean, this because I liked Alvin and the Chipmunks, so they sounded like Alvin and the Chipmunks a little. So I liked them, you know. And then I liked uh, Dave Clark from the Dave Clark Five, and uh, his snare drum was great. And then I like Keith Moon. I liked uh, Mitch Mitchell from Jimmy Hendrix Experience. And I liked uh, Ginger Baker from Cream. Great. And uh, my friend's father turned me on to a, to a jazz album by Buddy Rich. Uh, I was just blown away how fast that guy plays. You know, I, I didn't care if it was what he was playing. I said, I know I'll never be able to do that. You know, so I just continue uh, listening to a lot of the rock players, you know. So my dad listened to you in the 80s. Um, I grew up listening so to you. So did mine. I grew up listening to you all the time, and he tells me stories of, because he grew up in Toronto, when we'd go see you in Buffalo, when you, you guys would come over, um, you know, go to all your little shows and stuff. What was your favorite venue to play back in the, the 80s? Everywhere? Well, in the general kind of like... In the general area? Uh, I would say, um, I would say the Ritz, Irving Plaza, the Ritz, you know, those were the places to play. Uh, CBGB's was always a lot of fun. Uh, uh, the only thing I didn't like about it was sliding on the dog shit that Hilly owned because he never cleaned it up and he didn't take the dog out. Uh, and there were no doors in the bathroom. And, um, otherwise playing London was really cool. Uh, the US Festival in California was really good. So, you know, they're all, they were all basically fun fun to play, you know. And um, to me, they were all basically the same, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you, when you look out into that crowd, it's crazy. Like, we see videos of uh, these huge festivals in, like, South, South America and stuff, and the crowds are just insane. Insane. Yeah. There was one point when we uh, were uh, at a hotel in Argentina, and I think there were 80,000 people at the uh, soccer stadium. So uh, we couldn't leave the hotel, but when we did leave the hotel, we were in a van. So we had to part the crowd, and they almost, they almost tipped over the van. They were on top of the van, and I was there with the camera, holding on with one hand, because I wanted to get that moment. I got the moment, and it's on. It's in Roar, and it's in uh, I think uh, the lifestyles of the Ramones. But it, that was it, it. Was scary, you know. It was kind of scary because I, you know, I don't know what the heck they wanted, you know. Yeah. But I mean, we loved them, and uh, talk about a hard day's night. That's what it was. Times ten. Yeah, for yeah. sure. You've you've done everything. Like I mean, you've toured. You've been involved in making film. Uh, you guys were on freaking Scooby Doo and The Simpsons <laughs> and The Simpsons. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, like that's that's when you know you made it. To be Simpsonized, I was just gonna say yeah. to be Simpsonized. That's when you know. What what, what was that like? Did, did you you voiced your, your well, character? Yeah, Matt Matt's a fan. We went. We were in New York City, 
uh, in a studio, and his, uh, I guess his, his, you know, uh, producer or something uh, was there. And uh, we were, and the next thing you know, they, they just gave us the thing to read our lines that we had in in the series. My line was, "Gee, I think they liked us," but because I got a Brooklyn accent, I had to do it ten different times to be understood. So I had to go, gee, I think they liked us. <laughs> hey, I think they liked us. Have the Rolling Stones killed? Oh, sir, those aren't... Do as I say. Gee, I think they liked us. You know, I had, to, I had to like, you know, I had to get rid of the accent. So originally it was, gee, I think they liked us. So, so I could just see somebody going, what the hell did he just say? You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure to... And the producers... I guess, guess needed that just to have a choice of what of each one, you know. Yeah. The, the Ramones were mentioned in a few different Stephen King stories, and uh, I know you guys did Pet Cemetery, the song. Do you have any Stephen King stories you can share? Well, Stephen King, for some reason, uh, I think he denies it. We went to his house, we hung out with them, and. Uh, it was, I think it was in Minnesota, Minnesota or Michigan, wait, 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 wait. Maine, okay. And uh, we met the guy, very nice guy, very intense looking with his eyes, you know, very intense looking guy. And uh, Dee Dee had the book, wrote the song uh, with the help of Daniel Ray, who was the producer of Brain Drain. And uh, that was it. That's, you know, then we did the video at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, and that was a real grave we were going under. It was about 20, 30 degrees, and you could see our breath. It was so cold there. And it took, and I went there alone. I drove there, and, the, and there were no lights unless you had the headlights and the camera lights. But getting out of there was, was insane. So we, it took me about a half hour to an hour to get out of there. I saw a highway with cars going by with headlights. I just went down the hill and said, fuck this, and I got out of there. You know, I thought I was like, you know, you know, it's pretty weird being in there. <laughs>